Shalom from Jerusalem. This is TV7's Israel at War update. And as we continue to deliberate the latest developments from here in Jerusalem, it's always important to highlight that 115 days ago to date, the Islamist terror groups from the Hamas plague Gaza Strip launched an onslaught on southern Israel, declaring war by perpetrating a massacre, murdering some 1,200 mostly civilians, wounding over 4,800 others, and kidnapping some 246 people, including elderly women, children, and infants. 136 of them remain in captivity to date. Let's now turn to our TV7 editor at large, Mr. Amir Oren. Amir, what can you update us on the latest? So the fate of these uh, 100, uh, probably 10 or so um, captives who are still alive and 20 odd whose bodies are being held by uh, Hamas, the fate of those uh, captives uh, has been deliberated by the uh, espionage or intelligence chiefs of the United States, uh, Israel, and Egypt, as well as the, um, the Qatari prime minister. And uh, in Paris, um, the uh, news out of that meeting was that uh, it was constructive, there has been uh, some progress towards a deal in which there will be uh, a pause in uh, uh, activities, a pause uh, in fighting. Right now, the time has not been set, could be one month, perhaps uh, several more weeks. And uh, it is to be uh, decided uh, quite soon. Now, uh, as for the fighting itself, um, in Israel, uh, there have been two incidents away from Gaza, one uh, in Haifa, where um, someone, a Palestinian probably, tried uh, to kill um, a Navy serviceman next to uh, the uh, naval base um, in Haifa, which is adjacent to a civilian community. And then there was another incident uh, in the West Bank. In Gaza itself, the uh, uh, commando forces of Division 98 are methodically dismantling the uh, forces of Hamas. They found tunnels even under cemeteries. You know, a few days ago, the uh, Hamas uh, spokespeople had the temerity to demand that Israel be prosecuted for uh, a war crime when um, it went into cemeteries in order to find the bodies of hostages uh, who were probably uh, buried there. So it turns out that Hamas has command posts and tunnels under a cemetery. Now, one word regarding the fate of Yahya Sinwar, the leader of Hamas. Apparently, his position is quite precarious because many, uh, at least mid-level Hamas operatives, have been taken prisoner by the IDF over the uh, uh, last several days. And imagine what happens to such an operative who knows how to get to Hamas and who is promised, first of all, of course, confidentiality, then clemency, then a new identity and perhaps a new country for himself and his family. And finally, $400,000 if the information uh, he gives to his uh, interrogators leads to the capture uh, of uh, Yahya Sinwar. So obviously, it is not enough yet uh, to uh, ensure the Hamas leadership uh, is being caught or killed, but the IDF is slowly getting there. Indeed. I, I think it is important to note, however, that these terrorist organizations operate very methodically. Uh, they they uh, highlight that they are uh, establish various uh, uh, compartments within the organization. One side doesn't know what the other side does, or as is uh, the saying, the left hand doesn't know what the right uh, hand does. And, and therefore, to uh, establish hopes on mid, uh, mid to senior level uh, terror operatives to grant uh, such uh, vital information uh, would not always be uh, something to rely on. Nevertheless, uh, sometimes surprises do occur. Uh, such was the case, of course, with uh, uh, bin Laden and other 
uh, cases that uh, ultimately brought about their demise. Uh, so uh, it is, of course, uh, added value to keep interrogating and figuring out particularly where those arch terrorists are hiding and continuing to uh, direct uh, their terror operatives within this fight. Uh, a second point that I think is uh, important to highlight that the fight indeed goes on and therefore, I'd like to ask uh, and bring into the conversation the commander of the Israeli Air Force Task Force for Air and Missile Defense, namely Brigadier General in Reserve, Dolan Gavish. Thank you for joining us, General. It's always good to see you. Uh, I'd, I'd like to ask you particularly about uh, the ongoing battle. We saw still rockets being fired from uh, the Gaza Strip towards civilian communities, namely Nativot and, and other locations in Israel. What can be done in order to hermetically uh, clean the field from such uh, uh, projectiles from being launched and, and posing an actual threat to Israeli civilians time and again? It's not being emphasized enough because this is has become a, a regular way for the terrorists to just launch and, and we don't see even one headline throughout the, the world, for that matter, about those kind of incidents. Well, indeed, Jonathan, I think you're touching a very strategic uh, point because uh, if we are looking at it from a military point of view, uh, we probably would say that, that there is no hermetic uh, solution. Uh, we have to remember that uh, in the Gaza Strip, uh, there are millions of people uh, which are living there. Uh, the, the, the terrain itself is uh, very complicated, and if you want to close it hermetically, uh, you basically have to be there in uh, every point. And this is, of course, uh, one of the main reasons why there is a discussion now in Israel about uh, the day after, not only in Israel, of course, uh, what would be the day after, what would be the exit strategy and all those things, because in order to ensure that uh, this area would be clean, you have to be in this area, you have to fully control it and uh, Hopefully, this is something that would be done not by uh, not by Israel. At least, this is the Israeli official uh, government uh, statement that uh, there should be some force uh, without a decision yet who's going to be the one that uh, would be there. So, uh, this, this is very challenging. And even today, by the way, although we know that, uh, and, and as you mentioned, uh, although we know that Israel is in the control of uh, the northern part of uh, the Gaza Strip, of the center and northern part of the Gaza Strip. Still here and there, we do see uh, some rockets. Uh, so from, if I'm going back to the military uh, point of view, what uh, could be done is to uh, stay in the area, uh, to control it as much as you can also from uh, the air, and then retaliate if something is coming, uh, to defend it with the systems that uh, we have uh, today, such as the Iron Dome. We still have to remember that uh, in this world there were thousands and thousands of uh, rockets that were shot toward Israel and the uh, air defense uh, system, uh, mainly the warriors, of course, uh, operating those systems, mainly the Iron Dome was uh, um, in a very, very high percentage intercepting them. Uh, so the long-term uh, solution would be a combination of the military and uh, I would say politically uh, or pol from a political uh, point of view. Uh, and in the short term, uh, probably it would be a combination between uh, the offensive and the defensive side. From there, we can quote, of course, uh, Karl von Clausewitz, uh, who highlighted that war is the extension of politics or policy uh, by other means. And, and unfortunately, when the one does not accommodate the other, it's very hard to move forward and establish what uh, the military, which is a, a very order-oriented uh, organization, uh, needs to achieve. Now, uh, before we turn to our next guest, uh, namely the Finnish, uh, former Finnish Foreign Minister and Deputy Prime Minister Timo Soini, who is uh, always a joy to have on our uh, broadcast, I'd, I'd like first to uh, turn to Mr. Owen and ask about uh, the new conundrum or facade by the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees, which uh, following uh, an investigation, it was indeed revealed that at least seven, if not more, 
of its workers have participated in the October 7th massacre? Well, you know, uh, this brings to mind the famous line from uh, Casablanca, um, I'm shocked. Um, everybody knew that uh, Hamas operating uh, in Gaza has under its control whoever is there. All UN and other international organizations have to serve uh, at the pleasure of uh, Hamas. And UNRWA, of course, as uh, the biggest uh, of those organizations with some 10,000 employees, obviously they had no idea uh, at least some maybe they they uh, decided to turn a blind eye uh, to the fact that many of those uh, employees were Hamas uh, sympathizers or even members and uh, not only used their um, after hours um, time off duty time to work for Hamas, but also exploited their status as uh, UN employees to plan and supply and then take uh, uh, part in the massacre. Now, if you have uh, photographic evidence um, with the names of uh, people, their pictures, uh, it's undeniable. And uh, if there is a surprise here, it's uh, the speed in which so many countries have accepted the uh, fruits of Israeli intelligence uh, they have not tried to refute this evidence. And uh, the UN Secretary General and following him, the Commissioner General of uh, UNRWA, had to admit uh, that at least a dozen of their employees, they say that two of them are dead, one is missing, nine have been fired, but perhaps there are dozens more. Obviously, um, it casts uh, quite a shadow on uh, the uh, uh, statements by UNRWA that its hospitals were not used for terror, its uh, schools uh, were not used for incitement, and uh, the other such uh, denials which uh, um, have now been exposed as lies. Indeed. Uh, surprise, surprise. Uh, an organization that uh, has uh, fired its previous leader over a corruption scandal and uh, has uh, lost many funds over the years due to various corruption and reform or rejecting any type of reform. Uh, the previous U.S. administration under President Donald Trump obviously withdrew its support for this organization. Nevertheless, the Biden administration, uh, understanding the... the uh, potential implications to regional stability sought to once again bolster its capabilities at the re recommendation of military and intelligence. Uh, so it's, it's not only a political decision, we need to put that out there. Nevertheless, when we're looking at this organization, the method in which it operates in order to bolster uh, the civic society, so to speak, it actually pays for the jobs of the employees that must be local Palestinians. And by doing that, it is one of the largest, after the Palestinian Authority, uh, work givers uh, in the so-called Gaza Strip, Judea, Samaria, the Jordan Valley, and as well also in Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, and elsewhere. One of the countries that withdrew its support for uh, the this organization alongside uh, uh, we need to highlight, of course, the United States, Canada, the Netherlands, the uh, Great Britain, uh, and many more is also Finland. Uh, and therefore, I'd like to ask you, Mr. Soini, uh, what was uh, the prompt response that Finland undertook such a decision? Was it to follow uh, the other Western allies or uh, was it a distinct decision based on the, the clear evidence that implicated those uh, responsible for many of the atrocities committed, including the kidnapping and holding in confinement of Israeli hostages. This was obviously a big news in, in Finland. In the Nordic countries, there have been a lot of patience of what comes to the organizations which are connected to the United Nations somehow. But this UNRWA thing was clearly uh, a shock and uh, the reaction of the government was very tight and very quick 
they they said straight away this is uh, totally unacceptable and they made a decision very quickly that they will suspend and cut uh, the support straight away and the whole thing should be thoroughly investigated there wouldn't be any question if this is not cleared out uh, that uh, there is a revival to the to the support and this is very untypical of the nordic countries and also also in finland and uh, and uh, this really makes uh, uh, it it visible that where the whole uh, conflict originated now of course everybody is heard about the civil uh, sacrifice and, and children and women killed but the due course and root cause of of this uh, war and operation is uh, the brutal attack carried out by Hamas the 7th of October and uh, this clearly indicates that UNRWA like you, like you said it's an organization who should um, help uh, the local people and as such uh, the task is uh, highly appreciable but it cannot be a scapegoat or a shield to the terrorist organization and misuse that kind of trust is uh, the biggest betrayal of of the nations involved absolutely i think the uh construction minister in, in the netherlands was the one who said that uh, the uh, revelation actually implicates those countries that supported UNRWA as funding uh, some of those activities that ultimately brought about uh, the October 7th massacre. Of course, hopefully this can be uh, rebutted by uh, the investigation that should be uh, a fully impl- uh, independent investigation for that matter. Uh, nevertheless, uh, you know, I, I'd like to give a reason of a doubt to anyone uh, being uh, under suspicions uh, of this severity or any severity for that matter. But uh, this is quite severe nonetheless. Uh, let's now turn to General Gavish. I'd like to ask you particularly, the, there seems to be quite the escalation, not only on Israel's northern front, but also particularly the uh, Iraqi militias uh, launching a projectile towards northern Jordan, targeting an American base. Uh, This was initially uh, somewhat uh, pushed by the Jordanian uh, monarchy in in an attempt to claim that this was targeted in Syria, but ultimately it accepted uh, the the reality in which three service members of uh, the U.S. military unfortunately, with our sincere condolences, have uh, been killed and 35 others uh, give or take, have also sustained various uh, types of uh, injuries. What are we to expect from such a situation, and how was this projectile not shot? Well, uh, you know, you're you're right, uh, Jonathan. This is uh, is an escalation. I mean, we cannot uh, look at it uh, uh, in a different uh, way. Um, I think that, uh, of course, we have to go, uh, you call it all the ways, the, all the time, the, the elephant in the room. We have to go back to Iran and to see the boldness, uh, the boldness of the Iranian uh, behaviors, behavior in the, in the last uh, few weeks. They are uh, uh, shooting themselves. Uh, they are shooting uh, missiles to uh, Pakistan. They are shooting missiles to the Syria. Uh, and uh, now, uh, of course, uh, they are uh, working uh, with their uh, proxies. Uh, we see it in Yemen, we see it in Hezbollah, we see it in Iraq, and uh, we saw it uh, last night. So I think that uh, it is uh, an escalation, and uh, from the United States uh, point of view, it would uh, again put, uh, I would say, uh, a question mark of uh, how much really uh, the Iranian and its uh, proxies how much are they uh, deterred? Uh, we see it, uh, that uh, in Yemen, for example, although the decision of the United States and uh, some of the coalition countries uh, was to move uh, to the offensive, and indeed there were some strikes uh, in Yemen still, the Houthis are uh, not deterred. And uh, so this is really a big question uh, that would be in front of the uh, United States uh, with regards to his. Uh, a strategy and the uh, first question would be uh, what are we going to do with the Iran 
And not only the United States, we have to say this is the whole uh, Western world. What are we going to do with Iran and how are we going to react to, uh, uh, to all those uh, proxies uh, that uh, we mentioned uh, before too? This is, of course, the, the big question and one that uh, once that uh, soldiers are being killed, it raises the, 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 I say the volume of, uh, of this uh, question. We know that the United States uh, decided to shift some uh, Air Force uh, assets, uh, U.S. Air Force assets, uh, to the region uh, with uh, long flight uh, capabilities. And uh, so maybe this is a signal of uh, the forces that the United States is the building. And uh, once again, the real question is the strategic question. Uh, the real question, I think, is the credibility question or the intent of utilizing their power. And, of course, it is within the strategic context, of course. But, uh, Mr. Olin, I I'd like to refer this to you. Uh, when we're talking about this broader escalation, we see also Ansar Allah, namely the Houthi-dominated uh, terror organization, an Iranian proxy, launching now a projectile to the Gulf of Aden, expanding uh, the the scope of the uh, geographical scope of uh, the the distance uh, to which it was willing to shoot uh, up until now, uh, and uh, this escalation uh, in an interview that the Secretary of the Navy of the United States gave, uh, he highlighted two things that were quite interesting. Uh, the first one is that the United States is still not looking at this as uh, something that needs to uh, ultimately be. Uh, resolved militarily, but rather diplomatically. And second point that was quite interesting, and that is that when he looks uh, at uh, the situation, he was asked whether or not uh, uh, the United States knows how long this may take, because there are various economic implications. And he said, ask Iran. So apparently the, uh, the Biden administration is quite understanding that Iran is behind all those attacks. Nevertheless, maritime shipping is getting a hit time and again well two comments first of all regarding the jordan strike one should consider the possibility that whoever shot uh, these uh, projectiles missiles uavs rockets whatever it was probably not rockets because uh, it was um, quite on target wanted United States to retaliate against targets in Iraq in order to hasten the withdrawal of uh, American forces from Iraq per the request of the Baghdad government. So it uh, may have been uh, a clever tactic um, that was aimed to work against the United States if it uh, struck back without uh, further uh, thought. Now, as for uh, the um, other arena, um, the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aden, the United States is always following the same script. It starts with diplomacy and tries to defuse the situation by talks. If that uh, does not work, it goes to the United Nations in order to gain legitimacy by having a United Nations Security Council resolution. Only if that does not uh, help and the coalition that it builds for this particular crisis is not effective, does the United States under whoever happens to be at the White House strike offensively, especially if U.S. servicemen are being uh, killed or injured, as was the case with the Qassam Soleimani assassination four years ago. So this is the same playbook. They always go through the motions uh, while we here uh, would have uh, probably retaliated immediately uh, for domestic political reasons, because there are those in Congress who even now would say that uh, Biden is uh, warmongering. Um, uh, so Biden and the administration must follow the constitutional process before they go on a military campaign. I will say this very carefully. If the United States does not retaliate in force, it will draw additional, very painful costs to additional service members in this region, unfortunately. And I hope that uh, the U.S. will, as our 
largest ally uh, and most powerful ally uh, stand its ground and not allow Iran to utilize uh, the various uh, theaters for their own advantages. But uh, Mr. Soini, I'd like to ask you, since maritime shipping obviously has also implications for Europe uh, quite uh, heftily, if I may add, the last vessel that was targeted was British owned, uh, like many others that were struck. Uh, and uh, the costs are expected to rise ultimately uh, throughout Europe. Uh, how does the European composition of nations that are uh, taking part in Task Force 153, namely the US-led coalition uh, to safeguard maritime shipping, um, potentially contribute even more in order to ensure the own European national security interests? This is obviously a very big thing. In due course of time, there will be a shortage of components, so shortage of all kind of equipments, which are uh, the utmost importance uh, uh, to our economy and, and well-being and well uh, welfare state. And uh, to be uh, very straight, Europe has been too weak. We have been thinking uh, years and years in and out that the uh, U.S. is going to take care of this. And uh, individual uh, countries, for example, Nordic countries or Belgium, or they are so little, but they have a, a vehicle on this, and it is the NATO. What is the NATO for? And, and uh, if the NATO will uh, form a task force or a unit to operate, this is particularly a kind of operation which is to defend your own interest. It's not only the war, it is about the sustainability, well-being and economy. Economy and uh, also uh, the so-called to be sure that you are going to get components of food or whatever, is also defense. You cannot defend your country if you, you, your economy is in ruins. And I think that uh, this uh, shows the weak, uh, weakness of the so-called common European foreign and security policy. It sounds very good, but it is in this kind of crisis, it is slow and undetermined and, and uh, leaning to the United States. And I, I would uh, imagine that the United States are in due course of uh, um, time ready for the rougher actions, but the, they can be quite tired to clean the carpet all, also all the time and to take European free riders on board. And that is, I think, that why the NATO should be in, in, in better in equipped on, on this kind of things, but it has been taking a lot of uh, energy for the, for the NATO, whether Finland can enter, so we did. Now the process with uh, Sweden has been ongoing for nearly two years. Now the Turkish president uh, cleared, uh, uh, cleared uh, uh, Sweden, but Hungary, which uh, acts in a very strange way in the international politics, uh, leaning on Putin, is still uh, having uh, having as a hot hostage the whole organization. I think in the Western world, the coordination shouldn't be better, should be better. And in that sense, Donald Trump was very right because he urged the Europe to put more money and input to the joint defense. It cannot be always that US is going to take care of everything. Because in due course of time, it may think that it is, it is not. The U.S. that is, indeed. Well, uh, unfortunately, this is all the time that we have for today. So I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Soini, Kitos, uh, General Gavish, yes, and Mr. Oren, of course. And uh, I'd like to thank all of you at home as well. Until our next update from here in Jerusalem. Shalom.
Shalom, I'm Danny Ayalon, former Israeli ambassador to the United States, former deputy foreign minister and member of Knesset. Today, I'm very privileged to be hosting TV7's Middle East Review and also being a panelist of the various shows of TV7, which I find the most uh, enlightening, most educating, if you really want to understand the world, the global scene as well as the regional scene of the Middle East, it is worthwhile to watch TV7.